I think you can uh, you can hear me now. Uh, welcome for this Mobius webinar on inventory optimization. Um, I'm happy to see a few people who have taken the time anyway to um, to join, uh, even in uh, even in this holiday period. Um, I'm trying to get the last couple of practical arrangements done. Um, I think we're ready for it. So, um, well, welcome. As I said, uh, before we start, uh, I have a couple of uh, logistics aspects to the webinar uh, to share with you. Uh, first of all, questions. Uh, I will try to keep um, some time for questions that you might want to have to take something where I can see the time. Um, so I will keep some time at the end for um, for questions. Um, We'll see, I see how many people are online. Uh, normally you can just, in the course of the webinar, you can um, um, put your questions in the, in the text box. There is a chat box uh, in the webinar screen, uh, in the GoToWebinar screen, where you can just enter your, um, your questions and then I can read them. I will, I will try to answer them um, at uh, the end. That's, uh, that's one. Um, second thing, uh, if you're looking for a copy of the presentation, um, the easiest way to um, to get a copy is to simply send me um, a message, um, send me an email at the end of the of the of the webinar, and then I will uh, I will send the uh, the presentation back to you. That's uh, the quickest way normally to share uh, documents. The last uh, logistics aspect is a question uh, for all of you. Um, you will see when you close uh, the webinar, normally you'll get a very short uh, survey uh, on how what you thought of the webinar, whether it was uh, easy to follow, whether it was easy to connect, if you liked uh, the topic, if you liked the way I treated it, uh, stuff like that. Um, if you can just take a couple of minutes anyway to um, to fill in that, that survey, um, it really helps us, it really helps me to um, to be more precise in uh, what we um, what we put in uh, in the in the next webinars. Hmm? So um, I think most of you uh, know me or know Mobius um, in in a nutshell. Um, what we do in the industrial world, um, we intervene at at each of the strategic moments in a company's life cycle, and we work for companies that are. In a, in a quick growth phase and that need to professionalize or companies that are more in an optimization phase and are looking to reduce costs, reduce inventories, uh, things like that. What we do um, in terms of competencies is um, we work on supply chain uh, and logistics, uh, of course, touching all of the, the typical uh, supply chain uh, subjects uh, and logistics subjects. Um, we can also help clients or we also help clients in enterprise excellence um, and sustainability. And everything we do is, uh, is supported uh, or can be supported um, by advanced analytics. Yeah. So that's for us. Um, I will now go into the, into the real subject of this um, 45 minutes um, presentation. I will not uh, bother you too much with uh, commercial speak um, at this moment. So um, the first question I wanted to answer is why is in inventory so important in many companies? Right? We see, I mean, this is like 17 years that I'm, um, I'm working in a, in a consulting business. Um, and we notice that inventory is, is, a, is a recurring subject. Companies, even companies that are mature and, and, and have good supply chains um, from time to time wonder again about inventories, right? And I think inventory is so important uh, um, to a company or to a company's supply chain because it is one of those aspects uh, in a supply chain that has the, the quickest or the most immediate impact on the financial performance of a, of a company, right? Because basically inventory touches um, the profit of a company um, it's and it impacts the, the the capital. It impacts the cash that you need to run uh, to run your business. I just noted a couple of examples uh, to make that to make that clear. 
right? Of course, the first thing that, that inventory can do is if you have a shortage uh, and your, your customer um, really wants uh, a specific a specific product and is not willing to move to an alternative product but is just willing to uh, to go away um, or um, willing to go to a, to a competitor let me just check if there is no I thought there was a there was a comment I was worrying that you didn't hear me <coughs> um, you can get to lost sales of course and lost sales has an immediate revenue impact but in many cases, it doesn't it doesn't stop there. Um, companies that that supply automotive, uh, or companies that go into into retail, um, and probably even even others can can have extremely big penalties. Can have penalties when they don't deliver when they, their service level is is low or they deliver late. Um, they have to pay. So basically, the the lost sale is not just. Uh, a lost revenue, but can can become also a penalty, can become a, a cost um, that can uh, that can be extremely heavy, even in uh, in, in certain cases. Yeah? And then to avoid um, customer service impact, I see companies that 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 spend a lot of money trying to 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 absorb uh, issues at at the at the last moment. So instead of uh, having the the right level of in, inventory. Uh, companies pay for premium freight. Right? They 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 pay very very small transports. They go into air freight, and very quickly, if you go into um, this kind of transportation modes, you pay thousands of or hundreds of thousands of euros for things that could be much cheaper. Right? So basically, as soon as you get out of out of um, out of stock, as soon as you go into a shortage, um, costs start piling up. Yeah, and that is not only the case in logistics, but it can also be in production, right? If you come into a production environment and um, companies have to make last minute changes to cope with the unexpected customer demand that they cannot buffer with inventory, um, they can spend much higher costs to uh, to get the production done, right? And then again, it's, do I, it's, a, it's a balance between spending cash in inventory Right or spending much higher costs in in um, in urgent productions. Yeah. All of these are related mainly to too low inventories. Yeah. Inventories that are too high also have immediate uh, financial impacts. So first, of course, uh, would be a logistics cost again, a warehousing costs. Right, that's uh, quite evident. But the second one can be scrapping and depreciation. If we have too much in, too much inventory. And the inventory becomes impossible to sell because it has a, a, a limited life cycle, limited duration uh, that it can be sold, or just because the market um, has moved to another product, we can start de depreciating the inventory, so it just loses its value. And in some cases, uh, when we have to go into a destruction, um, we can even um, have to pay simply to destroy. Uh, product, which is of course um, a, a double waste, because we have produced it for nothing, and then we have um, we have to scrap it again. Yeah. And then, of course, the last one is cash. Um, the more inventory we have to keep, uh, the more money we have to invest in in uh, in our business, and the longer we have to wait uh, between the moment that we uh, buy product and the moment that we uh, get the money from uh, from the customer. So I think all of these are, are examples um, of why inventory and how inventory um, influences immediately and directly the, the financial result um, of, um, of an industrial company. I think that is, that is a big reason why inventory um, is such a big subject for uh, supply chain professionals like most of you are probably. Yeah. Now this is uh, this is a bit my my statement um, or my starting statement when it comes to inventory. Um, I think in many cases inventory um, is considered as the result between a difference between what I supply and and the demand. And when I ask why do we have or why is there so much inventory in a company, um, explanations turn around. We, we purchased or we produced because we thought we would sell and then we didn't sell or we sold more than we etc. It's always about differences between supply and demand. I think we should 
change the logic of, of inventory a little bit and make sure that most of the inventory we have should be the result of a decision uh, we have taken uh, to hold um, that inventory. And that will be an important part in what I will try to um, explain in the next um, in the next half hour. Right. So I'll go to the second question. The second question um, I wanted to answer in this uh, in this webinar is: Are there any rules of thumb we can use to decide what um, what a good level of inventory is? Um, because of course we can in in a discussion very quickly we can say our inventories are too high, but are they really too high? And what what can we what can we use to say is this the right level? Do we have the right level of inventory or not? Yeah. Of course, the f the first way to to answer that question um, would be to benchmark, right? And um, to give you an idea, I put here a couple of benchmark numbers um, for different industrial industrial sectors. And and what we put here was I put inventory coverage in days. So this is not turns. It's um, it's a number of um, of days of inventory split in raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Right, and then I put here the first quartile, so that's like the the, the best in class. And then the median, uh, which is like an an, an yeah, median, right? Um, and third third quartile is like the the lower part uh, of the distribution. Um, and as you can see, well, for most. Um, industrial sectors, finished goods inventories uh, stay below um, one month. Uh, of course, we can see that that sectors like food and beverage typically has lower inventories uh, than a machine and tools um, uh, company. Yeah, but what is also important, I think, uh, in these benchmarking exercises is that the spread between companies, even in the same sector, uh, can still be very large, right? So where best in class has then like, uh, I'll take a raw material ex materials example in machines and tools, 20 days of inventory and the worst in class has, has 80 days. So that's uh, almost three months of inventory, right? Um, so that's, that's a bit, it, it shows a bit at which point benchmarks can, can make sense to get an idea, um, but are always, um, it's a sensitive exercise simply because of the spread um, between companies that that can that seem comparable um, in terms of sector yeah. a second way to to benchmark or to look at benchmarks can be to look at inventory coverages or um, performance indicators over a long period of time and I, I like this this chart a lot um, of course, if not, I would not have put it in here, of course. Um, what you see here is, is uh, these are four pharmaceutical companies um, where, I, where we have made a, a graph for each company showing the evolution of inventory turns. So this is a, this is a turn, right? So three means um, that the inventory turns three times a year. Um, and earnings before interest and taxes as a percentage of, um, of revenues, right? And what you can see is that some companies um, have over over a period of 10 years, like the green one here, right? Has, has known a pretty constant or pretty stable um, improvement of the inventory turns, right? So going from a bit lower than 2.5 to almost three, uh, going a little bit down and then, and then up at the almost uh, perfect um, horizontal uh, in terms of profitability, right? Where other companies have have more difficulties to keep their um, their stability or improve um, inventory turns, right? Where some, as the the, the light blue one here, uh, we see that they have even had a significant reduction of inventory turns. It seems to try to move um, earnings before interest and taxes up. So if we look over time, we can see interesting uh, evolutions even in those benchmarks. But as I said, the spreads uh, can be pretty, pretty important. Yeah. So that, that brings me to my, to my key message or my key slide. Um, that is, of course, the best way to evaluate whether you have the right level of inventory is to calculate uh, your own best target. Yeah. Um, 
and and for that i think you you need to to have a couple of of words and a couple of concepts in terms of inventory functions um maybe well so some of you have um, if you have read the the blog i wrote in the um in the introduction um of this webinar you you will probably be um familiar with these um with these words already uh, but i'm very much much attached to them because i think they are the key to um to good inventory uh, management as so the, the five functions of inventory, right? So if we, if we look at what would be a good target for a company, I think the first thing to understand is, um, is there any uh, inventory in process or inventory in transit? It is, is there, uh, are there steps in the production process or in the transportation um, between factories um, that, that is so important that there will be constantly goods blocked? Uh, in the production process or in the transport itself, right? And if goods are on, on a permanent basis blocked in production or transport because transport between continents takes a couple of weeks or because the production itself takes a couple of weeks, um, that can be an important part in the, in the total inventory of a company, right? So that's the first type of inventory that we can um, take into account and that will always be there. As long as we produce, we will have goods um, in process. As long as we transport, we will have um, goods in transit, right? That's the first part of the inventory that we can uh, split uh, or that we can identify as such. Um, the second type of inventory we can um, identify and we should identify is um, possible strategic uh, stocks companies could have, right? And strategic stocks are in most cases stocks that are related to um, very very specific um, opportunities or very specific um, risks um, that you could uh, that you could have in, in certain in certain uh, environments um, it could be speculation stocks if you buy specific raw materials um, in function of um, of prices um, that could be that could become a, a strategic stock right so strategic stocks are usually stocks that you can identify very easily in a company, um, and that you can that you can uh, treat completely separately from the others. Yeah. And I'll go from top to bottom. The third type of stock uh, that you will identify to identify a target uh, will be cycle stocks. So cycle stocks are stocks that we have uh, because we do not produce or we do not purchase uh, every piece individually. Uh, we we produce or we purchase parts. Um, in, in lot sizes or at a, give, at a given frequency. So there will be a, a, a regular um, stepwise increase in inventory the moment that we, that we receive goods and then the inventory will be sold over time. Right? Cycle stocks can be small if we have daily or weekly productions and cycle stocks can be extremely small. Um, if, if you have products that you buy or that you produce only once a year or, or only once every every six months, cycle stocks can become very important. So especially for for far away sources or for slow rotating products, um, cycle stocks can um, can be a very important um, can be a very important. Um, I don't know if you guys see these uh, pop-ups. Um, I hope not. Um, Cycle stocks can be can be a very important part of um, of the inventory, yeah. and then we come to safety stock. I think safety stock is a very well known part of the inventory. Um, in some cases, it's an important part. In other cases, can be limited. Safety stocks are the stocks that you keep uh, to absorb what I call here normal uncertainty on demand or supply. Right, so it's a part of the inventory that you use as a buffer that you keep as a buffer. Uh, I will will come back to that. You can calculate it quite quite easily um, if you know the uncertainties you're um, you're facing. Yeah. And then number th the the last part number five um, is anticipation stock. Yeah? Uh, anticipation stock is stock that we that you keep at a certain moment in time um, to absorb a foreseen unbalance in supply and demand. Right. Sometimes we also call it seasonal stock. It's stock that you would uh, that you would build um, to uh, to buffer for a seasonal peak. If you sell a lot during um, during a couple of weeks and 
in summer or if you sell a lot uh, just before uh, the Christmas period, then you would build a stock in advance of the Christmas period um, to sell them all at once um, at, the, at, the peak of the, at the peak of the demand. Right? And if you know these five categories, you can actually calculate a target. Right? Cycle stocks um, is something that you, can, that you can estimate or that you can calculate or that you might even have uh, as master data. Um, safety stock is something that you can, uh, that you can calculate, etc. But I think what is important here, I'll come back to this chart for a couple of times, um, what is important here is especially uh, the fact uh, that if you think about targets for inventories, you should think about these five uh, categories independently and not try to build a, an overall target for everything. Okay. Okay. So that's like my, my first re recommendation. If, if you want to improve uh, inventory efficiency, um, define for your organization, for your company, for your supply chain, uh, define a realistic uh, but ambitious uh, target. Yeah. And this is something that is sometimes neglected, um, but I think I wrote it in the uh, in the in introduction invitation uh, that uh, demand-driven MRP has well um, put into. Um, into the, the focus of attention. That is the first thing to decide is where to position those inventories, right? Because I, I took here as a pretty simple example of, um, of a value chain with um, raw materials, semi-finished products, finished products, and then a central um, and the local stock. But you could of course decide to put inventories uh, on all of these levels, right? Or you could pick certain uh, positions uh, to keep more or less um, inventory, right? And the question is, what is the best position uh, to keep inventory, right? Um, and what we know is, well, if we if we talk about buffers, um, in the jargon we call that uh, decouple points, right? The idea of a decouple point is that somewhere in the process or at different locations in the process. Um, we create buffers that kind of make the downstream and upstream operations more or less independent of each other. So that if something happens downstream that the upstream can continue or that if we have an issue on an upstream process that downstream uh, the service level is not, is not impacted. So we can decide where and how many buffers we want to keep um, in our supply chain, right? And in general, if we're looking for the right places to buffer, and we don't want to put buffers everywhere because that would be a quite expensive uh, choice, right? Um, we will try to um, look at the, the right places to buffer in terms of lead time. So how far am I still away from my customer, right? Does this buffer help me to be quick uh, in terms of response on the one hand and on the other hand we will look for commonality so how many um, products finished products can I still make out of that buffer right is it already a completely independent product so is each product I keep in inventory already directly related to one finished product or even um, specific to, to, uh, to one customer Right? Or is it still a shared inventory? I will show that with two, um, two examples uh, that I put here. This is a case of, a, of an industrial company um, that has very few raw materials. Um, they make a number of, of finished goods out of, out of those materials, say like a, on between 100 and 200 uh, semi-finished products. Um, and then in the second part of their production step, they um, personalize the product completely to the customer. So once the product comes out of the second um, production step or the second phase of the production uh, process, um, the finished good is almost or completely dedicated to a customer. So every customer has a, has a finished good, but the semi-finished products are still customer specific. Right. So what we chose here as buffer points 
is we buffer on the semi-finished goods because there there is still commonality uh, but we have already um, passed phase number production phase one right and then we do not buffer anything anymore and we keep the inventory finally in a local stock um, close to the customer uh, because that is the point where I get I get best uh, customer service and there is no risk pooling anyway uh, in this um, in this process. Mm. Um, a second example I have here um, is, a, is an example of a, of a fashion company. Right. And in fashion, of course, uh, you can understand that the number of raw materials uh, also there is, is fairly limited. And then in, through, the, uh, through the different production steps, we get uh, more and more uh, varieties. Right? And then those varieties go into the different markets um, to be sold. Right? In this case, raw materials are a natural buffer uh, because there there's still a lot of commonality. Right? Uh, and then the second point is a central stock where I have my finished product uh, finalized, but I can still ship it to um, multiple markets. So that gives me uh, the advantage of uh, being pretty quick because all of my production steps are done already, but still have the possibility to ship to different markets. And because the product is pretty light um, and has a pretty high value, uh, from a central stock, I can ship quickly to any of the markets, so I'm still close enough uh, to the customer to um, guarantee customer service. Right. So I hope this gives you this gives you an idea. This is not an exact science. Um, it is it is finding a balance between uh, pooling the pooling the risk and and sharing products on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, being close enough to the market. Uh, to actually um, support uh, or buffer some of the uncertainty uh, from the market. And as a general rule, uh, I think we see that companies that, that really think about uh, inventory positioning and think about functions, you will see that, that downstream, the more you go downstream, the more you will see that the part of safety stock, so the part of the, the buffer becomes important Right, cycle stocks become smaller because transport, um, the downstream transport gives you more flexibility in terms of transport. And that upstream stocks um, will be much more related to strategic stocks. Most companies keep strategic stocks uh, on raw materials or finished or semi-finished products. Yeah. Um, and there is more anticipation stock and cycle stock and less safety stock. Right. It's typically the kind of, um, of system you would uh, you would find. Yeah, um, I think what what is important, of course, well, I'm an engineer, so I'm I'm a little bit um, attached to um, to quantitative uh, methods. Um, I believe that's important to define those those targets in a, in an objective way, right? Uh, in process and in transit, lead times can be calculated uh, based on uh, based on standard lead times. Strategic stocks um, should be uh, decided in a sales and operations process based on a business case, right? Because it's about uh, risks and opportunities. Uh, we can calculate them and we can kind of make a business case with a return on investment or a potential return on investment on strategic stocks. Now, in some cases, of course, strategic stock might be um, obliged by legislation or obliged by customer. In that case, there isn't a lot of decision to be taken on it. Uh, we just uh, we'll just have to. Uh, put it in place because um, it is a it is a constraint basically, right? Safety stocks can be just calculated based on a formula. Okay, there's a, there's no magic to it. Um, it's just a matter of getting the right uh, uh, historical data together and then um, applying the formula uh, and get used to uh, get used to it. Yeah. Cycle stocks are are more difficult to calculate in a, in a correct way. Uh, because the, the cost elements are, are not as objective uh, as they seem, right? Um, there's, there are formulas that allow you uh, to calculate a cycle stock in function of total cost. Uh, but personally, I think it is uh, always a good 
um, way or it's a, it's a good practice to check uh, cycle stocks in terms of coverage uh, and simply look at how um, how big a risk you take uh, or what what's the coverage of one lot size how long uh, how much demand can you cover uh, with one one production run or one order and and do you want to keep uh, coverages of, of a certain level I think that's a good and pragmatic way to um, to check uh, cycle stocks, whether they are too low or too high. Okay. And then finally, uh, anticipation stock. Anticipation stock can be uh, basically calculated. It's not something you have to estimate or we have to um, to guess on. Uh, with a good master planning, uh, we can basically calculate uh, anticipation stocks. And I will come back to that. Yeah. When I explain this to, to clients or potential clients, um, I almost always get this question. Is it necessary to do these calculations on a stock keeping unit level? Um, because it seems like hard and it seems like complex and it seems like it takes a lot of time. Uh, but my answer is yes, we should do it on a stock keeping unit level because um, if you have inventory on one product uh, and you need the other one, then the fact that you have inventory on the wrong product uh, doesn't help you. And that's the whole story, of course, of inventory, that it's um, something that, uh, that you need on a stock keeping unit level. On the other hand, I think we should not overestimate uh, the, the complexity of this, of this exercise. It's perfectly possible uh, to do this exercise even for um, large, um, portfolios of uh, products. Yeah. One thing we can do, of course, to make the calculation or to make the effort a little bit smaller um, is to use standardized assumptions for different segments. Right? And segments uh, are usually taken uh, or built in function of demand profiles. So um, how frequent is the demand on a, on a stock keeping unit? How stable or unstable is the demand? Um, and for the less stable products, it can be interesting to make a distinction between unplanned and planned demand. So how good can we forecast uh, or can we, uh, do we know uh, the instability uh, of the demand, right? And in that way, in fact, for each of those demand profiles, we can use similar assumptions um, to calculate the different types of inventories. Okay. And then on the other hand, uh, we can take into account, of course, supply supply flexibility. Uh, be it is is the supply very uh, flexible or very responsive, uh, or are there a lot of uh, supply constraints? And also there, we can use uh, different assumptions. Right? I think by using this kind of grid uh, to set the 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 most important assumptions, um, the rest of the calculations can be done on a stock keeping unit level, without uh, too much uh, complexity or, or difficulty. Okay, well, question number three is, now suppose I, I've, I've done a calculation, uh, I've done a benchmark, and I think my company still has much more inventory um, than the target. Well, of course, as I said, the first thing I would do is to calculate the target. Right, to get an idea of how much is there to um, is there to to gain, right? And what is the um, what is the real achievable um, inventory level that we could uh, that we could imagine? But then there's a couple of other things we can do, right? That go outside of the calculation. Um, and the first thing I think is is important, and I've I've come to 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 learn that a little bit. Uh, the hard way um, is is training. It's training people in in the in the concepts and the techniques of planning and inventory management. Um, I think the reason for that is simple. Uh, that is, uh, we can we can set up nice uh, nice tools and nice ways to calculate um, and nice formulas and etc cetera, etc cetera, and techniques. Uh, but in the end, the only thing that counts is what people really do, right? Uh, if we set up a system, uh, do they use it? Um, if we give suggestions on what the right inventory level would be or what the right uh, moment would be to buy a certain product or to produce a certain product, at which point 
are these um, suggestions uh, from a system respected and applied? Uh, um, it's what people do and the best way to uh, influence what people do is uh, to give them the knowledge and the skills uh, that they need to understand uh, what, what a good behavior and bad behavior uh, looks like and why it is important to do a certain thing and not something else. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, good uh, training of people um, is extremely important. Right? I notice even after so many years um, that in still in many companies people who are responsible uh, for supply chain uh, operations um, learn uh, their job in the field they, they they kind of know what what button to click uh, and what transaction to use and and where to put in a number uh, but basically the the basics of supply chain management are often still uh, vague or or not so well understood Right, and of course, uh, you can go into into big trainings, and I've I've seen companies where where almost the entire supply chain staff is trained in in uh, in the apex kind of of trainings like the certified uh, production and inventory management of um, of uh, apex or other apex trainings. But you could maybe also do things that are a little bit less ambitious and just focus on 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 the the, the basics of inventory management, the basics of of supply chain planning, right? Um, that could also already do uh, quite a quite a quite a change. And the most important thing is that that people get those basics and understand the basics uh, sufficiently to uh, to apply them. Right. And then, of course, the last thing uh, that you have to say about about training is uh, do not limit the training only to supply chain people. Right. Um, if other people in the organization, wherever they are, but as, as all the all the people who touch the value chain somewhere, uh, if they have even a basic understanding um, of this of supply chain principles, it will help. Uh, to talk a, a common language and to and to think um, in a in a more transversal way uh, about the supply chain impact of um, of decisions. I think this is a this is a very important uh, factor to uh, make companies um, inventory efficient. That's number one. Um, the, the second thing. Um, that that I think makes sense if companies try to uh, improve. Uh, on their um, on their inventory uh, efficiency um, it would be to have a, a good uh, analysis method of uh, shortages and overstocks and to really use that that method to um, to find root causes uh, and basically it's this is this is something extremely simple uh, once you have a target right because once you have targets identified you can at any moment in time um, Look at inventories and see how many of your stock keeping units um, are below the target, right? How many are somewhere in the in the correct zone, and how many are above the target? And if you see that you have items that are below the target, so where you have a risk to lose on customer service, and inventories where you are above the target, so where in fact you have more than what you need. Uh, to guarantee uh, stable operations. Well, for these type of items, you can actually analyze what are the root causes and why um, the inventories have occurred, right? And then you can use any of the um, of the the, the methods, uh, be it uh, PDCA cycles or DMIC uh, uh, techniques, to to figure out what the what the root causes are. Uh, for these uh, for these deviations, um, and how you can actually um, improve the way uh, the way of working, right? And I've I've seen um, at a number of companies how a simple technique like this, looking at deviations, and and finding root causes and solving root causes, uh, can make inventories uh, or can help teams uh, enormously to bring inventories under control. Right, and this is uh, again uh, not rocket science, but if it is done with sufficient attention, with sufficient skill, um, it can uh, it can help a lot. Yeah. 
And then the last, the last call or the last point I wanted to make um, was the point on on master planning, right? I think master planning is a bit the um, the, the planning process that 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 gets neglected, um, maybe because of its its perceived complexity. But master planning is 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 that that intermediate layer that you could find uh, between the very basic techniques uh, of material requirements planning, right? Or 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 distribution requirements planning in some cases. Sorry. Um, and the more tactical sales and operations plan. And somewhere there in the middle, uh, some companies put that master production schedule or, or master planning. I think that is um, an extremely powerful planning process to, um, to lead uh, the efficient use of inventory. Uh, because if you look at master planning and you do master planning right, Master planning can help you uh, to drive everything uh, towards inventory targets and to take into account all types of inventories, right? And this is my last slide. Of course, strategic stocks and in process and transit stocks are just there. I mean, we cannot plan uh, a lot on them. We just have to, um, to respect them, right? But then the others... Um, really become important um, in, in master planning, right? The first thing that, that good master planning can do and that no other planning process can do uh, seriously is master planning can respect safety stocks, right? The way MRP could do. Um, but master planning gives a planner the possibility because of the overall view uh, that, that he would have, he or she would have, um, to decide what is the right moment to rebuild the safety stock. So at some point, a planner could decide uh, that because of capacity constraints or because of priorities, um, it's okay to stay for, for a couple of weeks uh, in the red zone and then build it up again, right? So safety stocks, where safety stocks and MRP are just um, creating uh, demand and then it's up to the planner to go and figure out what is what is real demand and what is demand related to rebuilding safety stocks. Master planning gives the planner that possibility to say, okay, I rebuild it right, because I need it, or I'll, I'll delay it a little bit. It gives a kind of a of a flexibility, but with with a good uh, understanding and good visibility. Right. The second thing that master planning does is because it, it creates that, that long-term uh, or mid-term visibility uh, over an entire operation, it can help um, a planner to take decisions uh, about what the best moment is to, uh, to, to start a production on a certain, on a certain um, product uh, in function of inventory and capacity. Right? So where again, uh, MRP will just give quantities and dates without looking too much into uh, dependencies or without looking into dependencies at all. Uh, master planning can allow uh, a planner to, to really kind of uh, find a smart way of doing it. And some master planning tools will help with, with advanced techniques, but even if it's, if it's almost a manual process or, or a process with basic techniques, it will give that visibility and to allow to take better decisions. And then the last one, where master planning, I think, has a unique position, um, is in building anticipation stocks, so building seasonal stocks, right? Uh, what I see in companies that do not have a, a, a serious master planning, but that rely completely on MRP, um, is that if they have a, a season, if they have a peak demand, uh, that they have to do very strange or difficult things, tweaking, uh, safety stocks or tweaking coverages, uh, stuff like that, to kind of force an MRP to take into account the buildup of a seasonal stock, which is often complicated and often difficult and, 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 a, and a large subject of discussion. Where in fact master planning, because master planning knows capacity constraints and takes into account capacity constraints, allow you to calculate an anticipation stock just in function of the peak of the demand versus the total capacity you have. And by simply uh, anticipating in function of the capacity and leveling out the production in function of the demand, you can come to um, a better, a much better 
um, drive or much better coordination on the anticipation stock. Yeah. So I will stop here um, and and look at the questions. Uh, if I have to make a conclusion, I'll come to my to my conclusion slide right away. If there's one thing to remember, I think of this um, 45 minutes on uh, inventor optimization is this chart and and the importance of these um, of these functions uh, of inventory and how they can help you um, to better understand uh, why inventory is there, um, what's the added value of it, and then to understand how much you need, right? So starting from the in transit in, uh, in process on the one hand, the strategic stock, the safety stocks, the anticipation stocks, and the cycle stocks. Um, I think using this using this framework can help a lot uh, to make the distinction uh, or to make the discussion about inventory optimization um, much more uh, efficient and much more objective. Good, so I will open now the, the questions, see if there are any already. Um, if you have questions, you haven't uh, answered or you haven't put them yet, uh, this is the right moment to, uh, to do so. You guys seem pretty quiet. Let me just exp explain you again. Uh, thank you. There I see a question. Um, the question is, is there a difference between raw materials, semi-finished products, and finished goods um, in the approach? Um, in many cases, you can, you can treat um, finished goods and raw materials in a, in a pretty similar way. Um, because for raw materials, you, you, could, you, you can consider the, the, the production as the, um, as, as, as the customer. So most of the, uh, most of the approaches um, can, be, um, can be almost duplicated um, with, with production planning uh, playing the role of, of a, in many cases, quite reliable forecast. Um, Semi-finished products are, are often different uh, because semi-finished products are much more a result of, uh, of a planning exercise. Um, so that means that you have to, um, to, to dive deeper into the, uh, into the production process itself. Uh, to um, to look at 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 how you can optimize uh, semi finished uh, semi finished products, right? Many semi finished product inventories are there also because of of, um, of synchronization uh, issues and synchronization problems uh, between um, steps in the in in the production. So that would um, that that would mean that that uh, the way you you look at them, the way you analyze them, the way you improve them, uh, will will be much more related to the um, to the um, to the planning and see and and scheduling uh, process, and far less um, purely on the, on on the method that I that I describe now. Hmm. Good. So. Um, I see we're getting we're getting close to the end of the time too. Uh, so in in a couple of words, um, my conclusion of step step one is um, to be efficient in in inventory uh, utilization of two or to have efficient uh, inventories. I think it's important to start with setting a realistic uh, but ambitious target. And then the point two, three, and four is um, Efficient inventory utilization uh, requires good training um, of people in planning and inventory management so that the skills are there, people know why, people know the techniques um, and can learn to apply them uh, by themselves. 
I think a, a good continuous improvement um, process on shortages and overstocks can have very nice results um, in an, in a in a quite pragmatic and uh, and simple way. And then the, my my last personal call is if you want to get further on inventory management, uh, have a good look at the way uh, you do master planning. Yeah. Uh, on that. I would like to thank you um, for spending 45 minutes with me. Um, as I said, if you have um, if you have other questions or you want to, you want to receive the slides, uh, just let me know um, by email, um, or you can put it as a as a question in the in the survey. I'll pick it up from the survey too, uh, of course. Um, and well, when once you close this sound, this screen, you you close the the call. Um, I would really appreciate if you can uh, take uh, a couple of minutes just to fill in the um, questionnaire. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, have a good um, afternoon. Have a good day. And uh, well, I hope to talk to you uh, soon. Thank you. Bye.